Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 12th of February and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 15th of February with me, Michael Hewson. Before we get started, let's get a little bit of housekeeping out the way with various risk warnings and disclaimers. But by and large, um, it's been a fairly uneventful week for European equity markets. US markets have continued to grab the headlines with another series of record highs. And though the DAX has also managed to eke out a new record at the beginning of the week, there has been not much in the way of momentum behind any of this week's moves. So if we look at the FTSE 100 to begin with, we can see from this daily candle chart that um, we've seen a pretty much a sideways consolidation with the current rebound that we've seen since the beginning of the month holding below the 50 day moving average. So that's going to be, I think, a key level going forward. Asia markets returned from their Lunar New Year holiday on Friday in a similarly lacklustre fashion. And while the Nikkei 225 has also posted its best levels um, since 1990, um, there certainly appears to be more upward momentum in probably US, Asia and German markets than there is in UK markets at the moment. Now, not really. I think I think we can I think we can um easily understand why that is. Obviously the FTSE 100 has an awful lot of what I would call cyclical stocks in it. So it has travel and leisure. It also has banks. And as we look ahead towards next week, um, it's banks in particular that I'm going to be paying particularly close attention to. Before I get to that, um, what we have seen in the past week or so is a significant um, rise in inflation expectations. And that has provoked or prompted a little bit of caution about upside when it comes particularly to European markets. We can see that borne out in this week's UK gilt yield, um, which has hit its highest level since the 23rd of March last year, the, the, the day that the first lockdown was announced. Poked its head back above 0.5%. The US 10-year also popped its head above um, up towards 1.2%, this level here. So we're on the cusp of some very key levels when it comes to gilt yields but, and, and, and US 10 year yields. So um, in terms of further gains with respect to them, if we get an increase, if we get further increases in US 10 year treasury yields and potentially um, UK gilt yields, there is a risk, and it's a small one at the moment, that it, that could well have a little bit of a lag effect on equity markets on concerns about rising inflation expectations. Now, in the short term, I think a surge in inflation is unlikely. Um, but in the longer term, that is certainly being started to price in to bond markets, particularly US and UK bond markets. And to a lesser extent, also, I think in German bonds as well. Certainly, if you look at the direction of travel, when it comes to yields, they are heading higher. And I think that is something that we really do need to be aware of in the context of the rebounds or the resilience, shall we say. I think the resilience of equity markets in general. So 1.2% on the US 10 year, keep an eye on that. More importantly, also have a keep an eye on the UK gilt yield around about 0.5%, which is also edged higher. And the reason they're edging higher is simply because of concerns about the amount of additional stimulus that is likely to get unleashed over the course of the next two or three months. There's the US, there's the US $1.9 trillion stimulus plan, which is currently going through um, the corridors of power on Capitol Hill. Um, and which the Democrats are trying to push through um, without Republican support. 
We've also got the UK budget coming up next month, and Rishi Sunak in particular is under a significant amount of pressure to um, support the economy, support the UK economy even more than he already is. Let's not forget the furlough ends at the end of April. He's under pressure to extend that further. The fact is that with the various further restrictions that are set to kick in next week, quarantine restrictions, hotel quarantines, the likelihood that it's not probable that we will be able to go back to business as usual in Q2 or Q3 when it comes to overseas travel, that's likely to weigh on the airline sector and the travel and leisure sector, um, and already is in early trade at the moment. Airlines have slipped back from the gains that we saw last week. EasyJet, IAG, Whitbread, Premier Inn owner Whitbread has probably fared a little bit better, but also Cruise Lines, Carnival Cruise Lines um, was also downgraded today as well by Berenberg over uncertainty about the outlook for cruises and overseas travel in general. So there's an awful lot of uncertainty um, going forward. So while it's quite possible we'll be able to go on holiday in this country, it's not immediately um, it's not immediately obvious whether or not we will be able to go abroad as yet, and that's weighing on the travel and leisure sector. Um, it could could be as it could be next year before we even get any semblance of normal when it comes to overseas travel. Um, so that's essentially where we are with respect to um, stock markets. Vaccine vaccine rollout program is going well. The latest UK GDP numbers came in better than expected, um, and that's certainly um, welcome news. Having said that, the pound has slipped back a little bit over the course of the past couple of days, but that hasn't stopped it from hitting its highest levels in nearly three years earlier this week when it popped above 138. Now, it is slipping back a little bit um, over the course of the past couple of days. This high here of 138.65, given how 137.40.50 acted as a little bit of a barrier on the way up, I would expect there to be a significant amount of buying interest between 137.20 and 137.50 on any dip back down. Certainly, I think if we look, if we look at the line, if we draw a horizontal line through here, we can we can sort of see that there. And we've also got this this fib level, this long-term fib level that I drew in a few weeks ago, coming in on on that particular level there. If we just change that out to a month, do that, we can see this particular FIB level here. So we can see that my target for a move to 140 is still very much intact while we hold above my broader long-term support line, which is around about 136. Um, and we can quickly change that from there, go back to the daily chart here. And that's, but, basically around this series of lows through here, around about 136. So still very much of the opinion, buying the dips in cable is the way to go. Selling rallies in Euro Sterling as well. Um, now that we've broken below this 86.50 level here, we could, 88.60 yeah, 88, level here, we could squeeze back at the moment. We're finding a bit of resistance in and around 88.05.10. But I think while we're below 88.60, um, then we could well see a move back to 86. That's certainly my longer term target over the course of the next few weeks. Euro dollar, been a bit of a disappointment. Those of you who listened to my video last week um, will know that I was fairly bearish on Euro dollar once we broke below this support level of uh, 12070. Unfortunately, this, this particular move hasn't played out as I expected it. So Ultimately, that's one particular move that um, would have um, resulted in a bit of a loss. But having said that, we are still below the 50-day moving average here. That's acting as a bit of a cap. So certainly 121.50, 121.70, as well as these peaks here, that's likely to be a barrier in the short to medium term. I still, very I still remain very much of the opinion 
that euro dollar is very much a sell the rally trade it's just in this particular case this hasn't hasn't played out as i suspected it might well have done so one that's one we're just going to have to take on the chin sadly and that's the way it happens sometimes not every not every trade idea you you have will play out as you expect and that's why you have stop losses so that you can basically chop yourself out and then reassess and look at another opportunity as and when it comes along so looking back at the uk economy it's a big week for uk data we've already seen the latest fourth quarter gdp numbers um, we saw a one percent expansion in q4 so that means that we will avoid a double dip recession um, even though we are going to contract in the first quarter of this year with the bank of england estimating that we will contract to the extent of four percent having said that it's still the worst annual performance of the uk economy in, since 1709 apparently so obviously that's not good um but if you focus on what's coming down the line and not what has happened then hopefully um, the outlook does look much more positive there is a bright side to all of this we're not alone in this particular um, economic crisis it's a global economic crisis caused by a once in a lifetime pandemic and while the focus is going to be on the annual contraction the worst annual contraction since 1709 um, there is there are reasons to be optimistic the fact of the matter is that the bank of england is con likely to continue to remain fairly accommodative and ultimately the uk government does have full control of all the fiscal levers at its disposal to try and cushion the economy and get a rebound in q2 and q3 once the vaccination program continues to ramp up as we head into the end of this quarter and look at and look at look at the months beyond easter and i think that's something that you know we probably need to focus more on because gdp numbers are very much rearview mirror stuff um, so um, looking ahead to next week we've got more uk data to get our heads around starting with uk cpi inflation that's um likely to be a key bellwether given concerns about rising inflation expectations we certainly saw a big increase in german inflation in the most recent numbers but an awful lot of that was down to a vat increase so very much to do with a significant tax rise nothing more um, with respect to uk cpi which is on the 17th of february um, these numbers have fallen below the radar a bit simply because of the fact that they're around about 0 0.5 0 0.6 they're not likely to change that much for january core inflation is expected to remain about 1.3 1.4 but certainly keep an eye on ppi factory gate prices because that's where the early indications will be if there is inflation pressure starting to build up in the system at the moment short-term inflation pressures aren't an issue but certainly if we are going to see them that's where they'll start to build up so those are due on the 17th we've also got uk retail sales for january and uk public sector borrowing for january both on the 19th of february obviously the uk economy has been in lockdown for most of well for all of january since the 6th of january i'm not expecting a good number there we got a rebound of 0.3 percent retail sales in december that was a little disappointing given the fact that there was a two-week unlock at the beginning of the month which saw consumers go on a pre-christmas spending binge before restrictions were tightened again but i think there was an expectation that we were going to need tighter restrictions and maybe consumers held back a little bit that being said with the new lockdown being imposed in january it's likely that we could well see a one percent decline in retail sales simply on the basis that consumers generally don't spend anywhere near as much money after christmas than they do in the lead up so january to january generally tends to be seasonally a weak month for retail sales as people pay down debt and pay down bills and what have you um so not expecting big things from that we've also got the latest flash pmis for manufacturing and services um which um uh 
which are expected to, sorry, for February, flash PMIs for manufacturing and services for February. Now in January, they came in at 54.1 and 39.5. Services was particularly weak. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not we get an improvement on the very weak January number that we saw for February. And we also have public sector borrowing. Um, that's already at post-war records. It's certainly no secret that Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, would rather rein back on the support measures sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, circumstances dictate that he won't be able to do that quite yet. And we talked about UK gilt yields, borrowing costs and what have you. They're still well below 1%, even, well, you know, even below 0.5%. So they remain a very well anchored. In December, the government borrowed £33.4 billion with the economy locked down for most of January as well as the rest of Q1. This figure is set to move well beyond $300 billion, $300 billion, £300 billion by year end. We will probably see another £20 billion of borrowing for January. That's significantly lower than in December. January is also a big date for tax invoices and tax payments. Um, so they, that could see that number for January actually come in um, so at the lower end of expectations. Um, so public sector borrowing likely to see another significant increase, though not as much as December. So that's the UK data that we've got coming out. As I say, I've done quite a bit of talking on that, um, which brings me neatly on to the latest Federal Reserve minutes. Um, I don't think we're going to see too much in the way of surprises there. If we look at the way the dollar has behaved over the course of the past uh, few days, we can see that we have a, we've seen a fairly decent sell-off after we squeezed all the way back up to this series of peaks through here. So there is some element or expectation that we could see um, further dollar strength, but at the moment, we are struggling on that basis. And that dollar weakness that we saw um, helped pull euro dollar back up towards um, back up towards 121.50, um, thus negating my lower euro scenario in the short term. I'm still of the opinion that the dollar is probably going to start edging back up again. For the time being, um, it can't really make up its mind. And that is a bit of a that is a bit of a concern, but nonetheless, we've got a bit of a messy consolidation going on here um, with decent resistance in and around this sort of 960 area. So I'll be paying close attention to that over the course of the next few days. With respect to dollar yen, we've pulled back lower off the 200 day moving average. So that's likely to be a key barrier going forward. But in terms of the strength of the dollar, um, the fact that dollar yen hasn't broken this uptrend line leads me to believe that the dollar will ultimately continue to edge higher. And that's why I'm not ready to throw in the towel on my euro dollar opinion that we go back towards 120. Dollar yen is still looking fairly resilient. And on that basis, while we're above this uptrend line here, I still remain fairly comfortable with the idea that the dollar is going to go higher, with the exception of against the pound, where I think the pound has probably more room to move higher against the dollar. And the reasons for that pretty much well known in terms of the fact that the economic outlook is probably slightly brighter for the UK because of the much better adaptability that the UK has when it comes to its own fiscal policy, its own fiscal support and its monetary policy support than is the case in Europe. So lower euro sterling, pound will, could well go back to 140. It'll be interesting to see whether or not it gets much beyond that if the dollar can, continues to remain fairly resilient. Anyway, I'm digressing slightly. I was talking about FOMC. Recent comments from Jay Powell have suggested that the Fed's in no hurry to go anywhere. So I will be surprised if there is any surprise whatsoever about this week's Fed minutes. 
Fed Chief Jay Powell, as, along with Vice Chair Richard Clarida, has clamped down on the messaging that came out at the beginning of the year that um, the Fed might look at tapering its bond purchase programs slightly earlier than expected. He's still been very dovish when it comes to the US economy. He's continued to make the point that it's very, very fragile. And on that basis, then I think it's highly unlikely that we'll get any, get any hawkish surprises from this particular meeting. And even if we do get anything mildly hawkish, given where US Treasury yields are right now, I would suggest that much of that is probably already in the price when it comes to US bond markets. We've also got US retail sales for January. They're um, coming out on the 17th. Unlike the, UK, unlike the UK economy, the US economy hasn't been locked down. If anything, um, we've seen a modest loosening of restrictions in places like California, um, which would suggest that after a week in November and December for the US consumer, you could well see a bit of a bounce back in January. Um, if we look back at November and December, when it comes to US retail sales, we saw declines of 1.1 and 0.7%. Since then, the economic data has picked up quite sharply, um, helped in some part by the new $900 billion stimulus plan that was agreed at the end of last year, and expectations over another $1.9 trillion over the course of the rest of this quarter. So this is likely to translate into a rebound in consumer spending, consumer confidence, and expectations are for a 0.8% rise in US retail sales for January, which could extend into February and March. So if we quickly look at this week's key markets, we've talked about the fact that the S&P made more record highs this week. We look at this chart here, we can see that here. What we can also see is in the last four days, even though we've made modest record highs, we haven't really gone anywhere. There's been an awful lot of uncertainty about the overall direction travel. We're sort of just trading sideways. So while it's been a record breaking week, we certainly haven't seen any significant amount of what I would call direction or volatility. Um, same applies to the German DAX here, again, record high on Monday. Since then, we've drifted back a little bit. It's really struggling to really gain a foothold above this 14,000, 14,100 14, level. And re we really do need to gain a foothold above that to suggest um, progress on gains going forward. When it comes to the Nikkei, it's very much the line of least resistance here. We can see that since the breakout that we saw at um, the end of last year, we've pretty much gone one way. With the next target for me, that 30,000 area, it's, it's really psychologically important. And I think the market investors will want to, you know, investors will want to go in that direction. So 30,000 remains the next key level. It's also important to remember with Chinese New Year, Asia markets are probably likely to be less, um, you know, less liquid um, than they would normally be. They'll probably be a little bit more subdued. So those those are the, those are the key markets there. In terms of numbers that I'm keeping an eye out for this week, UK banks, NatWest Group, and Barclays. Let's look at NatWest because. Of all the big four, we've seen a significant rebound in that West share price over the course of the past quarter. It's been a bit of a roller coaster start for new CEO Alison Rose. Um, she's rebadged the bank from RBS to NatWest, and she's done a fairly decent job of giving the bank a nice makeover but not before we made new record lows back in September. Um, since then, the share price has almost doubled. But ultimately, while she's given the bank a makeover, given it 
given the paintwork a bit of a buff up unless you fix what's under the bonnet you're still left with the same old banger underneath so for me it's really about how she continues to navigate the restructuring of the bank going forward and how the bank is able to help the UK economy over what is going to be a very, very difficult next two to three years. Now, the past 12 months has been one of damage, limit damage limitation with the concerns about Brexit deal, the pandemic, all of the problems that's brought about, then the amount in, the amount in impairments the bank has set aside, loan loss provisions, NatWest says it expects full impairments of between three and a half and four and a half billion pounds. It'll be interesting to see how that figure or whether that figure has changed with the new lockdown restrictions that were brought in at the beginning of this month. Because I think in Q3, at the end of Q3, the expectation was, all things being equal, the annual annual impairments will probably come in between that amount if they get adjusted up and there's a good there's a there's a good possibility that they might that could well act as a headwind going forward but we can see from this chart here there's decent areas of support in and around 145 146 um, on the plus side higher bond yields and a steeper yield curve is likely to improve its net interest margin which is the lowest which is one of the lowest in the UK banking sector at 1.65% so looking for any extra provision for non-performing loans but also looking for an increase in its net interest margins if we get positive news on both then we could potentially see a move back through and above 180p here and the last time it was there was in the second of march so we're pretty much we're very very close to 11 month one year highs the big question now is whether or not NatWest full year numbers can continue what has generally been a very good news story since the lows back in September. So that's NatWest. Barclays, also got Barclays full year numbers. Again, this chart here, you may have noticed on the NatWest chart, this was overbought and so is Barclays. And if we found a decent area of resistance just below 160p. So what's the story with Barclays? Well, you know, I mean, it's been a difficult 12 months for banks in general. You saw the fact that the NatWest share price hit a record low. Barclays has been able to ride out the trials and tribulations of the last 12 months, probably better than most. Um, overall performance since the beginning of 2020 has been disappointing. Having said that, Barclays has been the best performer amongst the big four banks currently down over 15 percent where it finished 2019 so the, the recovery of the march lows has been a bit of a slower one and certainly when barclays made its lows there natwest was all the way down here so certainly in terms of the sell-off or the slow decline from the june highs to the september lows it certainly was much more muted than say for example netwest and since then we've seen a fairly decent recovery. So for me, it's the same story, non-performing loans. How much does Barclays set aside? The year to date so far, it's around about 4.3 billion pounds. Um, so big question for me um, will be is how much extra do they set aside with respect to non-performing loans, net interest margins. More importantly, unlike NetWest, Barclays has a very big investment bank. Does Barclays follow in the footsteps of its US peers and have its investment bank drive profits higher? Or does it fall short in the way that some banks in Europe's investment banking operations have fallen short? So US deepening of the yield curve should be positive for Barclays. Investment banking hopefully is gonna be positive for Barclays. If it is, we should hold this uptrend line here head towards 160 and head up towards 180. And if they are decent numbers, you could get some talk about look at reinstating the dividend. So that's Barclays. Those numbers are due out on the 18th of February. NatWest's groups is out on the 19th of February. The one remaining item I'm keeping an eye out for this week, Walmart. 
Walmart has been one of the key US retailers taking the fight to Amazon. You can see it here from this chart here. Um, I would imagine it's probably the US equivalent of Tesco's, if you like. It sells pretty much everything that you want. It's hit record highs. It's taken the fight to Amazon when it comes to e-commerce. It increased e-commerce sales by 74% in Q1 in terms of free cash flow year to date. The business has seen an increase of $9.7 billion to $16.4 billion from the previous year. So free cash flow has almost doubled for Walmart, despite the fact that their costs have gone up and they've employed in excess of 500,000 extra people this year alone to deal with the pandemic. It's obviously managed to sell its ASDA operation in the UK, so it's drawn a line under that. And it recently acquired Ribbit Capital um, in an attempt to get into the fintech space. Now, Ribbit Capital owns Robinhood or has a stake in Robinhood. So it seems to me that Walmart might be want to go into the fintech space. Profits are expected to come in, in and around $1.50 a share. With respect to key support area on here, we've got fairly decent support in and around 140. You can probably draw a line through these series of lows through here. So I'll quickly just do that for you. There we go. Probably not so much. Maybe draw a line through there. But ultimately, what we've got here is a succession of higher lows and higher highs, starting to run out a little bit of a momentum. So the only way I would be a bit concerned that we may have reached a short-term top for Walmart is if we drop below that low there, which is around about 137. So keep an eye on that um, particular support level when the numbers come out on the 18th of February. OK, um, I think I've rambled on enough. One thing I would have a quick look at is Brent crude. Let's continue to defy gravity. And I think that's another reason why we've seen a big rise in inflation expectations. The big rise in crude prices is at some point going to feed through into fuel prices at the pump and could actually act as a bit of a break on consumer spending if they are allowed to continue to rise at the rate that they have been. So that's one other thing to keep an eye out for going forward. What we want to see with crude prices is for them to start coming back down again, um, because ultimately I think there will come a time that they could start to cause more harm than good. Anyway, that's it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you all have a great weekend. And in the meantime, I'd like to wish you all a very um, good, restful and enjoyable weekend. Thank you very much for listening. It's Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets.